Good evening. I'm Gene Aller, pastor of Word of Hope Church, Katie's, Kentucky. We're so glad you joined us tonight. And, uh, I know it's been difficult. Church is different. We can't get together. We meet this way. But also, this has been a tremendous blessing. Right now, the gospel is being preached around the world more than ever before in the history of mankind. Messages are going out. They're going places through Facebook and other mediums where they haven't been before. And there are people getting saved. I've read of one online ministry. Uh, they had over 100,000 people contact them uh, about salvation. So it's amazing how God takes what is difficult, turns it around, and gets glory out of it, and changes and transforms lives in the process. We serve a mighty God, even in the midst of a virus. And I do want to remind you that God is not self-quarantining that he does make house calls, that all that call upon the name of the Lord can be saved, and salvation means everything that we need. It's not just going to heaven when we die, but it's what we need in our daily lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we start our message tonight. Father, we just thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Lord, that's how we know everything we know about you, is through your word. And we pray tonight, God, as we share scriptures, that you would anoint that, and that it would touch hearts, Lord, that it would be an encouragement. Lord, that it would draw people to you. Lord, that it would increase faith in our lives. Lord, we thank you and praise you, Lord. God, I thank you for the honor and privilege that I have to go into people's homes or wherever they're at and share the gospel uh, through this medium tonight. We just bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Saturday nights in our church, typically we all come together and pray. So what we've been doing on Facebook Live is the first 30 minutes, 6 to 6.30, uh, I teach a message, and then I get on Zoom. And if you're interested in getting on Zoom and joining the actual prayer meeting, uh, send a message to the uh, in the comment section uh, of the YouTube uh, live that you're. I mean, the Facebook page that you're seeing right now, Gene Oliver, where you're watching this, or send me a message in Messenger, and we'll we'll help you get signed up in that, so you can join us for the actual prayer time. And if you've got a prayer need. I encourage you to send that in. Just put it in the comment sections, and we'll be able to look at that, and we'll pray for you as we're praying. We usually pray from 6.30 to about 7.45, and I continue looking at the messages uh, throughout the week, and sometimes other prayer requests come in. So we will pray for you. We will remember you. Prayer is amazing. It's the instrument that God has given us where we have fellowship and communion with Him. It's what connects us with Him, and it's a wonderful opportunity. My message tonight is called Boldness Through Prayer. And I want to read a couple of scriptures first uh, before we get into the actual message. But uh, uh, Psalms 91, 15. Uh, he shall call upon me. Who's that? Well, that's the righteous, the one that spends time with God. He will call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honor him. And then uh, in Psalms 145, 18 and 19. The Lord is close to all them that call upon him. He, to all that call upon his name and truth. He will fulfill the desires of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. And then Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. Sometimes people say, well, who's wicked? That means anybody that's unborn again, unsaved, an individual that doesn't know God. Wicked doesn't necessarily mean you're a murderer or an adulterer or a fornicator. You're just an individual that has not yielded your life to God, and God considers that wickedness. Man's best goodness is filthy rags in comparison to the holiness of our great God. But now he doesn't want to keep you away. He wants you to come. He wants you to cry out to him. God is easy to find if we seek him with our whole heart, and God is calling and drawing. This is the day of salvation. Don't wait. If God's tugging at your heart, run after God with everything within you. He loves you. If you're a backslider, come back to God. I think during this time, uh, many people are thinking about God and spiritual things in their lives more than normal. And I really hope that doesn't change when the pandemic's over. I hope we continue to be concerned about God and who he is in our life and what he wants for our individual lives. I tell you, there's nothing more important in this world or the world to come than your relationship with our Heavenly Father through His Son Jesus that died for us. 
That needs to be the priority of your life. Jeremiah 33, 3 is a verse that I love. God says to us here, Call upon me and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things that you did not know. So prayer is an amazing tool that we have been given. It is powerful, and it will change our lives. And I want to go to Psalms 84 as we begin tonight, and we're just going to read a few verses here, and then we're going to go to Hebrews. But uh, uh, Psalms 84, 7. This is talking about those that follow the Lord, uh, those that love to go into his house if you read the whole psalm. But it says, they go uh, from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion, they appear before God. O God of hosts, hear my prayer and give ear unto my cries, O God of Jacob. And then it says, Shelah. And that means to stop and consider and think about that, that God loves for his people to come before him. He gives ears when we cry out to him. He listens to what we're saying. And, and we need to pause and realize that prayer works, that God hears our prayers. Even when we don't see an answer in the immediate, things are going on. Sometimes when I pray for people, sometimes they'll say, well, nothing's changed. I say, well, how do you really know it hasn't changed? Just because you haven't seen the change yet doesn't mean it hasn't happened. So then verse 9 says this about God for the believer. Behold, O God, you're our shield. And we ask that you would look into the face of your anointing. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Now, this was King David talking about his relationship with God. He said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. You know, you can tell the difference between the saved and the unsaved, the righteous and the unrighteous. The righteous have a hunger for God and the things of God, and the unsaved, quite frankly, don't. Before I knew Christ, I grew up going to church sometimes. I never paid attention. I couldn't wait to get out the door. I went to church because, you know, I thought I had to. I thought I should. Uh, and, and I didn't value. I didn't learn anything. To me, it didn't make sense, and I didn't care. But there were other things I was very interested in that I ran hard after. And in my life, in particular, I ran hard after wrong things and sinful things, destructive things. But then when I came to Christ, and I didn't come to Christ because I got good all of a sudden, I came to Christ with a messed up life. I was, I was a wreck, and I didn't have any peace. I didn't have any, any joy in my heart. I couldn't see any real reason for living. And so uh, I came to God, gave my life to him. And then as I began to go to church, then I began to get an interest. I began to have a heart for the things of God. When I began to learn to read, I, reading the word of God, I, I began to understand things, and, and I had a hunger for that. You see, when you know God, you, you want to know him better. When you really know who he is, that motivates you to get to know your heavenly father better. So there's a difference. Believers have a heart for the things of God, the word of God, for prayer, for worship, for the house of God, for fellowship with believers. And lost people, well, they have a heart for other things that are outside of God. And I tell you what, nothing satisfies like God. Verse 11 of that. Uh, Psalms 84 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield, and the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusts in me. And, and Psalms 84 is an awesome psalm. And you notice it talks about that he doesn't withhold any good thing to those who walk uprightly. There are many today that, that talk about what they believe in God. But what we believe in God must be lived out in our lives. It's not enough to have a good belief system, to have great theology, to have great understanding if we don't live for Christ. It's the way we walk. We must walk uprightly before the Lord and before man. If you want to, turn with me to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And if not, just write that down and you can look at it later. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And I'm going to begin at verse 11. And there again, the whole chapter is an amazing chapter. It talks about entering into rest with God and laboring to enter into that rest. It talks about being careful not to leave any of the promises of God undone in our lives and, and even uh, to be careful about getting off into unbelief. We don't want to get into unbelief. We want to be a believer of the Word of God. Uh, Christians are called believers because they believe God and His Word. 
They can trust the Lord, put their hope and confidence it's in God, not in the things they see, but in the God that lives and dwells in them through the Holy Spirit. God is eternal. His plan will last forever. His word will never pass away. But everything down here, my friend, is temporal. It is fleeting. It's not going to be here that long. We need to have all of our hope in God. And in that place where we can rest secure, he's an anchor for our soul. So verse 11 of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The children of Israel who, who knew the word of God and the promises of God, the Bible says that it was not mixed with faith in their hearts. And so they got into unbelief. And unbelief leads you into sin and disobedience against God. And he tells us to be cautious about that. Labor, make the effort of your life uh, living for God. Make the, make, put, your, put your life into pursuing God. Make that the most important thing. And believe his word and not go after the, the ways of those who live in doubt and unbelief and fear. Verse 12 says, for the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints in the marrow, and is a discoverer or a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse 13 tells us what that means. There's nothing hid from him. God understands and sees everything. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of the Lord to whom we have to do with, the scripture says. Everything is known to God. And then verse 14, 15, these are amazing verses and promises. It's talking about Jesus. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. What is our profession? Well, it is our confession of the word of God. It is our profession of faith that we've, uh, you know, acknowledged that we were a sinner. We've asked Christ to come in our heart and forgive our sins. And, and, you know, we believe that he died for our sins on the cross and was raised from the dead. And because he lives, we live also. But it is every other confession and profession of the word of God. God wants his people to speak his word. God's word has the power to change the circumstances. The supernatural working power of God's word spoken out of the mouth of a believer standing in faith upon the word of God, trusting and hoping the Lord has the power to change the circumstances of their life. So he says, we've got this high priest that's in heaven seated with the father. Who is that high priest? Jesus, the son of God. And because of that, we hold fast to our confession of the word of God. For our high priest, uh, for we have a high priest uh, that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points like as we are yet without sin. You know, other high priests, religious leaders, they may not know what we're going through, but Jesus does. You know, it's amazing to me that Jesus is the high priest of God. Uh, he's the founder of our faith. He's the author and finisher of our faith, the scripture says. He's seated beside the Father in heaven, and we can hold fast to what the Word of God says. You know, he became the Word made flesh. He was born a man. He was born of Mary and lived a man's life. He was born with flesh and blood like you and I. He experiences the same with, uh, weaknesses and temptations. Uh, he never gave in to sin, sickness, disease, or fear. Never did. He was tempted in all points like as we are. What have you ever been tempted in? Christ was tempted in that manner. But he never did sin. When the enemy came against him to tempt him, he didn't give in to those temptations. No, he stayed fast, held to the word of God and the promises of God, just like he tells us to do. And he overcame all those things, sin, sickness, disease, Death, hell, and the grave. He overcame every form of temptation. He lived a holy life set apart for God while he was in the flesh in this world. And because of that, he can, he can understand what we're experiencing. But it's not that he understands that so we just are comforted and we remain that way. No, no, because he overcame, you and I can do all things through Christ who's given us strength. The scripture says that we could be more than conquerors through Christ. So because of what Jesus did for us, then we too could walk an overcoming, victorious life. A lot of times people say, well, 
I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But I, I challenge you to study the New Testament. We're saints when we get born again. Paul addresses the letters that he wrote to the saints in different places. He refers to saints. We're saints when we're born again. We used to be sinners, but we've been made a new creature. We're not self-righteous. That's what we are before we're saved. But we're made righteous through Christ who gave his life and he bore our sins on the cross. And he became sin, even though he didn't know sin, he didn't experience sin, so that we could become righteous just through the power of God. And so we're not just acting that or saying that. We become a new creature. We're changed. And so verse 16 of this chapter tells us something that's pretty amazing for the believer. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Did you hear me? The word of God says that for us to come boldly to the throne of grace. What do you think the throne of grace is? That's God's throne. We come boldly to the throne room of God. And what happens there? We obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. You see, God wants his children to have access. That's what prayer is all about. Oh, yes, the Bible teaches about humility, and we need to approach God in a humble manner. Uh, the scripture says if we draw near to God, that's us drawing near first, he draws near to us, that God is close to a humble and broken heart, and that is true. We do have humility and reverence towards God, but at the same time, when we've got needs, he tells us here that we come boldly. We come based upon the promises of his word, the sacrifice of Christ, that we're born again through the shed blood of Jesus, that our sins have been washed away. And we go there when we need mercy, when we need grace. We come as a child to a father in need of help. We go to him and say, God, I need your help. And God's all right with that. He doesn't put you off. The, the indication is there is, is that we don't have to hesitate or be afraid to go to God. We come boldly. And we can be bold with God in prayer. We can say his word. We can declare his word. We can ask God for great things and God wants to meet those needs. Now let me tell you, God's greatest concern in our lives is that we know him and that we fulfill his will and purpose for our lives. So prayer is not just about me getting what I want. Not at all. Prayer is about me surrendering my will to his will and becoming a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ going wherever he leads me in this life. Oh, he does meet needs, and, and he gives me wants in my life so often. I think about things that I daydreamed about or desired in my life, and many times those things have come into my life without me ever pursuing them because God has blessed me and done things, and people have gifted me with things that, that I, I wanted that I never had even told anybody, but I thought, boy, I'd like to have this or that. God blesses his children. The scripture says he does exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we would think or ask. So we can believe God to do great things like that. But let's talk about this prayer. First of all, uh, the who, where, and why and result of this particular message. Uh, how do we approach God? Well, if you're a believer, you can come boldly to God. Where do we go to? To the throne of grace, the throne room of heaven. It's the throne of grace here. Grace is that unmerited favor of God upon our lives, upon his children. And we can come there boldly saying, God, I stand in need of your mercy and grace today. And God answers that prayer. And, and we come to obtain whatever it is that we need. Mercy, grace, help in time of need. We find grace to help us in times of need. Right now, I don't know your situation uh, with, the, uh, with the virus and quarantine. For me, it's been all right. You know, I spend a little more time with the Lord in the Word and in prayer and in worship. And I'm here at the church. I'm not running around doing things. And so I've got more time with God. Of course, I call and text people, send out emails. We do some Bible studies on Zoom. And, and uh, you know, for me, it's been a time of spiritual refreshment and growth. Uh, I'm not concerned about where I get to go or what I get to do as long as I can just do something with God. I'm pretty content with that. And so I want to encourage you, use this time to get closer to God, no matter how close you are or how far away you are. This is a pause in our lives. Uh, you know, the calendar's been cleared, and, uh, you know, our routines are not the same, and many don't have to go to work, and uh, you can't go shopping, and you shouldn't be vacationing, and you're not supposed to be going to friends' houses. You're supposed to stay at home, and this would be a good time 
to really pursue God like never before. You see, God speaks for himself. If you'll run after God, you'll find him to be an awesome father that loves you so much. And even if we know the Lord, there's always room to deepen our relationship and have just great fellowship with God, even in difficult times. Now, <clears throat> the grace of God. I want to I want to go over to first, Second Corinthians chapter 12. This is the story where Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh, which, by the way, it tells you right in the scriptures what it is a messenger of Satan that buffeted him. In other words, everywhere that he went, people rose up against him and riot and persecutions came upon Paul at a supernatural level. And uh, in verse 8, 2 Corinthians 12, 8, uh, Paul said this, I sought the Lord three times that this might depart from me. And he said to me, I want you to hear what God said to Paul in this time of, of persecution and difficulties and struggles. He said, God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Now, weakness doesn't mean sin there. It doesn't mean departing from God, but it means in a struggle, in, in a situation that leaves me physically or emotionally weak, uh, in a time when, when, when I'm overwhelmed, uh, in a time when it's so difficult. Uh, God's grace is sufficient. I think sufficient in the King James is a bit understated. God's grace is more than enough. It's incredibly abundant. It's overflowing in rivers into the lives of his people. And I will say, by the way, it, it never, people will say, well, it says uh, it never, God never took that from him. It doesn't say that at all. At the time he wrote this, he had prayed about it three times. God said his grace is sufficient. But that didn't mean it didn't go away the next week. I don't know what happened. I think Paul lived his life until the time of his execution and great overcoming victory. And we read that in the letters that he wrote. What is it in your life that you need God's grace for? There isn't anything that God's grace is not big enough. Now, grace includes the forgiveness of sin, the healing of our bodies, the meeting of our daily provisions. Grace includes helping us get through tough situations. Or difficult times. Grace helps us with the fruit of the Spirit being developed in our life. You see, grace helps us in all kinds of ways. And he then said, of course, my strength. God's strength is made perfect in your and mine weaknesses. In areas we're struggling in, God comes along and he fortifies us and we have the strength of God when we fully depend upon him and we're able to get through everything. So then Paul says, then therefore... I gladly would rather glory in my infirmities that rest upon that the power of Christ might rest upon me. You see, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers him out of them all. You have to go through the water and the flood and the fire in order to experience God getting you through to the other side. Paul was saying, when I'm having troubles then, I'm going to rejoice and look up because the power of Christ is going to rest upon me. God is sufficient in every way. His grace, His mercy, His power, His ability to supply and help you, His deliverance is sufficient, more than enough, more than abundant, that He can help you from the lowest point of weakness to lift you up in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The scripture tells us that the power of Christ might rest upon us. Are you walking in such a way that God's power is resting on you? Are you allowing yourself to enter into that rest that Hebrews 4 talks about where we come boldly to the throne of God in times of need and there we find grace to help and mercy to help so that we're carried on the presence and the strength of God in difficult times like Paul was. Somebody has made this statement as we wind down the message. Somebody said, whatever you need lies on the other side of whatever you fear. Whatever you're needing lies on the other side of whatever you fear. It is the fear of the enemy that keeps you from accomplishing what God's called you to. It is the fear of not being enough as a person, of thinking you're not able or you're not qualified. Maybe you think, I don't have much ability. Let me assure you, the only ability that God really needs is availability. 
If you're available to God, He can take you because His grace is sufficient. His power rests upon us when we can't do it. He does it through us. We can depend upon God. During this time, uh, maybe you're struggling financially. Maybe uh, anxieties and fears over the future uh, are bothering you. I encourage you right now uh, to trust Him, to realize that the fear is getting in the way from the promise that God has given me. And so we cast all our cares upon Him. We refocus our mind not on the problem, but on God who solves the problem. When we're overwhelmed, the psalmist said, we run to the rock that is higher than I. We don't dwell on the problems. We dwell on the good things of God, the provision of God. And we ask God in the midst of this tough time, we ask God, Lord, what can I do for you? God, what can I do for you today, Lord? What could I do for you this week? What is your direction for my life? Because Jesus said when we saw, seek him first, that he would take care of everything else in your life. Don't let the fear stand between you and God. Don't let the lies of the enemy stand between you and God. Don't let the failures of your past stand between you and God. Because right on the other side of those obstacles that the devil's put there, God has a completed life for you that's well worth living. Jesus loves you and he cares about you. He's got a plan for you. You can trust the Lord. He is awesome. Paul said in verse 10, uh, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He's strong because of the power of God. He's strong because of the sufficiency of the grace of God and the mercy of God. So I think that we need to be trusting God even more. There's all kinds of scriptures about trusting the Lord, putting your hope in God. I want to encourage you tonight, uh, whatever it is that's going on in your life, anything that is distressing you, get rid of that. Lay it at the feet of the cross and go pick it up. God is very real and present help in time of need. You can depend upon God. He's not way off somewhere else. It's not religious make-believe. The Bible's not story tales. It's God's word to his people. And many of the stories in the word of God helping people during times of famine, during times of flood, during times of locusts, during times of the enemy rising up against them. And God was delivering his faithful people. Let's just get faithful to God. Right where you are today, you can be 100% faithful. You can yield yourself wholly to God. Get in and read the word of God like never before. Pray and seek the face of God. Put on worship music and, and love him and adore him. God loves you and cares about you. I'm going to pray a prayer with you right now. If you would like to receive the Lord, pray this prayer with me. I apologize for the rain, although I thank the Lord it just quit. I could hear it pounding on the building, and I hope it didn't make it hard to understand the message. But let's pray together right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, that the prayer, that the rain quit right now as we begin to pray. We just rejoice, Lord, in you for doing that. Lord, we pray for those that, uh, Lord, need to know you, those that are lost. Lord, we pray they would come to you as we pray a prayer right now. I pray that many would pray that prayer to receive you. Folks, just pray with me if you need Jesus tonight. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sins and come in my heart. I've made a mess of my life, but I need your help. I'm afraid. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, I'm concerned about the uncertainty of my future right now, and I need your help. Lord, forgive me. Become Lord and Master of my life. Take my life and use it for your glory, your purpose. Lord, give me a desire for the things of God. Help me hunger and thirst after righteousness. Lord, I thank you for hearing my prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I've got a, an online resource. If you'll let me know through uh, sending me a message, uh, I'll get, you, get that to you and it'll help you. Nobody's going to come see you. It's just an online resource to help you for the next 30 days. Maybe you're a discouraged believer. This would help you as well if you need that. So you get in touch with me and I'll, I'll get you that resource. And uh, guys, if you've got prayer requests, please, please send those in. Uh, give us a prayer request in the comments or message me on Messenger to Gene Holler. And our team of people are going to be meeting in Zoom in a couple of minutes. And we'll be praying over your needs. Let me remind you in the morning, 10.30 a.m., we'll be having church here again. And 
and Tina Fink's going to be here and, and uh, do a song for us. I really enjoyed her singing in our services. We're looking forward to getting our worship team back and, and being able to uh, uh, have regular services again. But until then, we enjoy. We ask you to join us on our Facebook Live services. God bless you. You have a good evening. Good night.